right. So uh, welcome back, Year 10s. We're going to go into the next section, um, which I think is called To Be of the Party um, or Of the Party. It's a strange um, title, but uh, not so strange when you remember that there is something called a hunting party, not a birthday party. <laughs> and so it begins suddenly with Brugden, who uh, kind of crawls or creeps into the settlement and he's got um, a spear sticking out of the side of his chest um, and he is done for is the description. Um, he, um, so Rook is not surprised. He's kind of numb and he feels this emptiness, this gap where happiness once has once been as concrete by this news. And this impossible time that he had, he was Kamara, the private self, this time has come to an end. And it's also publicly come to an end, the peace between the natives and the, um, the British. And so um, Rook is invited to attend the barracks that evening. He kind of thinks, oh, I can feign illness. I can pretend to be unwell. But he really realises he can't get away with that. So he's... And he's also instructed that this is an order, that he is under obligation to be present, um, no matter what was the gist. Um, and so they um, they go to the barracks, the army barracks, the military, the marine barracks, and um, everyone knows that nothing can be the same now because Brugden was the governor's own man. He was the gamekeeper, the representative of the... Um, the governor and so silk as master of the story is at the center of attention and he's telling the story and uh, so the gamekeepers went to this place near botany bay they call kangaroo ground they saw some natives creeping towards them with spears in their hands and the others were alarmed don't be afraid brugden says oh, i know them and everyone's watching silk and rook started thinking how does silk know all of this He's questioning the story. Is it 100% true? Don't forget, Silk is quite motivated by selling a story, telling a story, not necessarily as close a relationship with the truth. Um, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. My mum, one of her sayings, I think it was sort of joking. Uh, he laid down his gun. He spoke to them. So Brugden spoke to them. He apparently knows a few words, but one of them jumped on a tree and launched his spear without warning in um, Brugden's side. Um, and I've just written here, it definitely appears to be a one-sided story that the natives attacked without reason. Um, but I wonder if that's actually the whole of the story. Uh, so he's not dead yet. The weapon penetrated his ribs but didn't kill him outright, but he's dying basically, and especially at that time. Um, there, there wouldn't have been the ability to have medical intervention the way that we do with modern medicine today. Um, it's like there's a sense of disappointment by people, an anticlimactic event almost, um, as long as someone else was the victim. Um, but Silk says he's living still. Um, he will die, but only by inches. So he, they just he just got stabbed in the right place to big die for example and it could have been anybody says rook i mean says timpen timpson um and they brought one of the natives to the hospital and said if any attempt were made to extract the spear death would instantly follow wonder if that's because it's cursed i don't know um, anyway, um, Rook feels this dragging within him, it, it, like this, and he imagines the same way as it is inside, the spears inside Brugden. You, you wanted to rip it out, but you know you can't. I wonder, hmm, who knows? 
Anyway, um, so Warangun examines the spear and says that the assailant or the um, one doing the violence was a person called Ganangare from the Banot Botany Bay tribe. And Rook knows him, this man, Garangare. He may have even been one of them who used to visit at Rook's hut, who was so entertained when Warangun was making fun of mimicking Major Wyatt. And everybody is angry and he feels that something had ended and something was beginning. Um, but Rook didn't want anything to end. He wanted nothing to begin. Lennox pipes up with the gun is the only language the buggers will understand. Um, mark my word, a few deaths and we will be shot of them for good. Yep, forget all that flummery. It means crap about amity and kindness. And then, of course, they're thinking about the best course of action. Everyone, it's all well in hand. and um, But... Willstead remarks, how long will they go unpunished before the governor does what he should have done months ago? Um, and so um, we talked about that idea of a proportional response, which is a life for a life, but a disproportional response might be multiple lives so that you would never, ever allow something to happen to our people again. Um, and... Um, right at the end of 242 is the next thing that I thought of highlighting to you all. Um, and Rooker's internal monologue, he thinks about the way that this interaction has gone down and he thinks that there might be another way of looking at what the natives did. He imagines Warung Warungun explaining, these uninvited guests arrived in his home. They had been pleasant. They offered small gifts, trinkets. But then they stayed longer than visitors should and they rearranged the place to suit themselves. This particularly I can feel, you know, they started planting crops, they cleared land, they built huts. His grandmother had a saying for it. There are two things that stink after three days, fish and visitors. Um, and I think that importance that we recognise that here Rook's insight into the Indigenous perspective um, it represents uh, Grenville's views, I think, that um, we see through Rook imagining Warrington's point of view, we see a much more mature, a much more modern view to the colonisation of Australia, which is invasion, essentially. It's a claiming of land, not a, you know, colonising Um and so we go, then go into this next section where um, Rook, uh, Silk comes and, and visits with Rook and tells him we're about to go through this um, task of significance. They drink the sweet tea, the Warabura tea, and they say we're going out on a punitive expedition, kind of a punishment excursion is another way of saying that. Um, and Silk is going to be the one who leads it. And um, it's interesting because Rook sees this shine in Silk's eye and something about the corners of his mouth, like he's excited about this prospect. Um, and Rook says, well done. Well, thank you, Rook. Yeah, um, he's kind of perhaps ambitious. Um, we see Silk's ambition. And... Rook says, Garangare, that's the name of the man, I think. Rook's voice is flat, but his heart is beating fast. And Silk says, yes, Garangare is indeed the name, and my instructions are simple. We are to bring in six of the natives who are at Botany Bay. Six? Not Garangare alone? Well, actually, Rook, between you and me, the government wished me to bring in ten men, but I suggested six would serve the purpose well. So this is that disproportional response. And when the governor asked Silk, which men did you want to make up the party? Well, yours, Rook, was the first name I mentioned. You and Wilstead and myself. And they're going to go for two days with three officers and 30 privates. 
so 30 lower class officers, and double rations. So they get a bit of a gift, I guess, a prize for doing it. Um, and he imagines it. He pictures the men walking through the woods and, like, with packs. And he could picture it, but he couldn't see himself. He just couldn't imagine himself in this line of 30 men. But he was reminded that he's a soldier. He was a man who'd sworn to serve and obey. And this feels like forcing open a rusted hinge. It feels difficult. It's awkward. Like makes him cringe. It's just uncomfortable and all of these feelings. And no, he says without thinking. No, I think not. So he refuses. He's standing up and saying, I don't want to be part of this. And um, Silk says, well, he asked me which offer I, I would take. I named them Rook and Wilstead. He has your name, Rook. Um, and there's a whole bunch of imagery here about the sun falling on Rook and maybe it's meant to be symbolic or maybe it's just meant to make a mental picture of the time of day, but um, you can choose to analyse it if you like. Um, and Rook thinks of the native's perspective, watching him, seeing Kamara, friend of Tagaran, in whose mouth their language was beginning to shape, take shape, marching with the others and his musket, and he just couldn't think what words he could use that would persuade Silk not to do this. And then he does this little, he tries to explain the sophistication of the Gadigal language. Um and how it's even more sophisticated than like ancient Greek. And there's like all of these different pronouns like that we don't have in English, you and me or all of us or me and these others but not you. Um, and English just has me, you and um, so first person, second person, third person, basic, whereas these are all these nuances. Um, and he's trying to, I think, convince them. I don't know, I was like convincing Silk of how – incredibly sophisticated these people are how worthy they are and he's not to be persuaded silk says i have given your name to the governor all right so after we've gone out we've done this there will be no more of this business of spearing our men and rook feels like he he's like he wants to say but he can't say to silk i cannot do this because the men we bring in might be the uncles the cousins even the brothers of tagaran he can't say, I cannot do this because I'm too fond of Tagaran. And then he says, do not ask me. You're a friend. Do not ask me. I would not deny you, but do not ask. I have friends amongst the natives, as you know. It's like begging. But Silk says, well, I am aware, but this is not a request. This is an order. And there's that feeling. Um, and then Silk sort of says, look, are we actually even going to find anybody in the woods? You know how good they're hiding. And and I can't, I'm really I've got question marks here. I'm trying to analyse what Silk's purpose in saying this is. Oh, it's not going to be as dangerous. You know, probably nothing will happen or like, I don't know. Um, but... The governor can't let the spearing of that poor wretch go unremarked, but he describes it as a show of force, as a piece of theatre. And he imagines, um, you know, the sounds involved. It's these 30 people clanging away through the bushes and he knows that the natives can hide because they know the land. But um, so... Um, Silk, I guess, is trying to convince Rook to do anything that, like, to agree to go, maybe. Um, and he just assumes, yep, we're leaving. We're leaving on Wednesday at sunrise, and I'm going to send the lad out with um, rations. Um, and I'm going to stop there for this little video, and then we'll go and the next one.